Hello and welcome everyone to this RSA event. My name is Zoe Billingham and I'll be chairing today's discussion with Alex Niven, a author and writer from the Northeast and an academic also based in the Northeast. I am director of IPPR North. We're a think tank based in Manchester, working for the North and regions like ours. And I'm delighted to be joined by Alex. Welcome, Alex. Hello, Zoe. It's lovely to be here. Alex is a writer from the Northeast, and he has regularly written for other publications, The Guardian, The Tribune, The New Statesman, and is currently a lecturer in English literature at Newcastle University. His book, which we'll be discussing this afternoon, The North Will Rise Again, is the subject of our conversation today. If you're watching live, we would love you to join the conversation. Please do share your thoughts and comments in the chat um, and use the hashtag RSA North if you'd like to join in on the socials. So I've been spending the last week or so reading Alex's brilliant new book, which I thoroughly encourage you all to read. I have the hard copy with me here today. And it really, for me, is a, it's a historical account, yes, but it's also a personal account, a cultural account of where the North has got to over kind of its recent history and how that shapes today and the possibilities for the future. So we all know, you're, as if you're watching this today, that, you know, we're at a pivotal moment again, in a sense, for the North. Um, obviously, the most recent kind of political incarnation of regional development and levelling up um, has been the kind of centrepiece of politics over the last few years. And with just two years until the next general election, it's really a contested space with parties vying for political attention over devolution and, and the policies and politics that, that come with that. So it's a really exciting moment to be discussing kind of how we got here and all the influences through the, the recent history and cultural um, goings on in the North that have brought us here today. And of course, it's, it's not a new topic. We've been trying to rebalance the country for decades under different political forms and guises, but with regional inequality at its sharpest that it has been in such a long time, it couldn't be a more pertinent topic. So I'm really pleased that this is what we're discussing today. And I suppose, Alex, I wanted to start with the very title of your book, The North Will Rise Again. When for you did the North last rise or what, what's the reference point to your book? It's a, it's a good question. Good question to start off with. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's slightly opportunistic title. Uh, you know, you want to make a splash um, and you want to uh, grab people's attention. Obviously, the, you know, the, the fantastic cover art uh, also does that going big with pink. Uh, which is always good. Uh, so, you know, it's obviously also a reference to the fall song uh, of, uh, of the same title, The North Will Rise Again, of the very early 80s. Um, nonetheless, it obviously does have pertinence to the content of the book. The book is about various attempts to revive, uh, regenerate uh, the North over the last sort of 50 or 60 years. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, the the, the obvious point is that the, the North has never really um, risen to parity with London and the South East. I mean, the Industrial Revolution is obviously the kind of big defining moment in the North's modern history. Uh, and this is very much a moment when the North goes from being a very peripheral area of civilization almost to becoming at the center, at the kind of vanguard of civilization, as it were, or, uh, you know, technological progress we might say and that to an extent balances out the power dynamic within England or Britain uh, and obviously when deindustrialization de happens throughout the 20th century that to an extent reverses that process and that's really the the kind of history that we're still living through uh, of course this uh, this kind of long period of deindustrialization and its after effects. As you say, it's it's very much felt, and I guess at IPPR North, we very much focused on the sort of political and economic ramifications of this, but your book really focuses on the sort of cultural journey that the North has been on in at the same time as this, as you say, industrialization and deindustrialization. To what extent do you think the 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 culture that you describe in the book and all the references you make to the films, the the TV series, the bands? Are they in reaction to what's happening in the North or do they also have a role in shaping the North's recent history? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you need to acknowledge in in writing anything what your kind of area of specialism is and what your limitations are. And I get in and, I, you know, sure to get in a footnote in chapter one, which sort of says, if you want to follow the kind of hard CO2 economic statistics, go to IPPR North and obviously the various uh, kind of state of the North reports in particular, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the, the best body of literature we have about the North's the kind of recent trajectory. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge that that was, you know, that's your area of expertise and, and not mine. Nonetheless, uh, yeah, I mean, I, my stock in trade is imagined communities in Benedict Anderson's phrase. I'm a, a literature uh, guy in, in the day job. So I'm coming at this question from the point of view of the imagination, uh, works of art, I guess, kind of dreams of what the North is and what it might be. Uh, nonetheless, it's not, you know, it, this isn't a, a purely cultural history. I, I guess I would also sort of see myself in a kind of uh, what R Raymond Williams would have called a sort of culture and society tradition where you're focused on culture, but you're obviously aware of politics and economics and very much not trying to leave those things out uh, and trying to kind of, I guess, to an extent, hybridize culture and economics um, and try to, you know, bring those two things together as a way of um i guess uh predicting predicting the future if, if if you can do that or or trying to sort of come to some sorts of conjectures about where the north's headed and if given we're now talking about the kind of cultural element of your book albeit as you say there's kind of a wider focus too i'm kind of interested in how how you see the bridge between the kind of cultural happenings you know north being at the the vanguard of mod modernism and being at the the forefront of of cultural movements in in the UK, and I'm interested in kind of the effect you think that's had on the North and where you think that leaves the North today culturally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's it's fair to say, as with with any work of writing like this, that you know, I, there's a degree of ambiguity, and and I feel deeply ambiguous about. The relationship between culture and politics and and how those th two things might interact in terms of a way forward for the north i mean you know I, I think generally i think culture has come up against the brick wall in a sense we've had various attempts and various kind of narratives suggesting that the, the you know that the north or peripheral areas in, in britain more generally can revive themselves through culture and through various cultural schemes uh, you know that's not to sort of dismiss those schemes entirely but I think it's it's pretty clear that you know you can't do it through culture alone uh, you're not going to kind of revive uh, the northeast for example purely through uh, uh, initiatives focused on the arts which isn't again to sort of denigrate the arts I obviously believe passionately in them um, but I think, you know, ultimately, obviously, the, 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 the kind of conclusion of the book, if there is one, is that we need a, a kind of radical political uh, settlement or solution uh, to regional inequality and culture can only get us so far. On the other hand, sort of beyond that, I guess there's a sort of degree of fatalism or, or pessimism that in the, in, the, in the near future, given that we need such a kind of radical overhaul, I think, of, of the current uh, our current system of governance that perhaps that's not available to us in the short term it might happen you know in the kind of medium term to the long term I, I kind of I guess in a sense fall back onto culture and on this notion of in a sense the best we can do at the moment is this sense of kind of imaginative freedom for people in the north based on a kind of history of cultural uh, kind of a, a, a escapism but escapism with a political undercurrent so you know for example factory records would, would, would be the kind of classic example and i look at this in the in the final chapter um you know factory records this kind of like psychedelic um scheme you know with kind of an escapist kind of druggy aspect to it i kind of use the term acid northumbria to bring together all of these kind of uh cultural uh imaginative schemes nonetheless i think there was a, a hard kind of institutional basis to factory records which was about relocating a portion of the music industry to Manchester to the north in order that you wouldn't have to have this narrative of migration um, such that kind of northern musicians or artists you know have to 
kind of relocate to London in order to get by, which is still, unfortunately, you know, I think if anything, we've sort of backslid a bit. Uh, you know, I think we'll go on to talk about Manchester in a bit more detail, but I, but I think still, you know, nine tenths of the culture industry is is based in London, uh, and I think, you know, th there is still a space for cultural schemes like Factory Records and, a, a, you know, the kind of imaginative and political freedom that they bring. It was interesting, wasn't it, with the recent debate, was it the English Na National Opera and the the uh, the forced move or, or the, the, to the discussion over whether there would be a forced move due to funding cuts of it into the North and actually some of the commentary around that yeah. was quite revealing, I think, of people's still inherent biases, thinking of that there, there wasn't enough pre-existing culture in the north for there to be such a such an institute up here like i found that quite shocking yeah i mean it's it's sadly representative i mean you, you sort of sympathize with the people involved in in one sense in that they've been kind of you know kind of dumped into quite a tricky position where you know uh, you know they can say say the wrong things quite easily but yeah i, I think it that sense of you know the moment you try to relocate even a even a single institution northwards there's you know this kind of kicking and screaming narrative of you know we just won't you know we don't want to leave london uh please don't do it to us um which yeah i mean i think you see that time and time again in the in the sort of cultural history of this country absolutely and whilst we're here and talking about manchester obviously you had your own sort of personal journey if you will having been um born in the northeast and sort of interested in the regeneration and the life of Newcastle but then when you when you were involved in your band everything everything you kind of saw it perhaps as a as a Manchester thing I'm, I'm kind of both interested in your your experience of the kind of two cities side by side geographically if if not culturally yeah that's a really good question and yeah something that I've thought a lot about um yeah I mean I think I, you know my experience of Manchester was in the in the noughties in the late noughties so I, you know, I again have a footnote which makes clear that I, you know, I haven't lived in Manchester for fifteen years or so, um, and a lot's happened in that time. Um, I mean, I think the kind of main thing that's happened over the last fifteen years is that, to an extent, Manchester has been built up, uh, you know, as as you say, as like a, you know, a kind of alternative London, which just hasn't happened in Newcastle. You know, there was a sense in which in the noughties there were almost not quite on a par but you know there was you know a big sense that Newcastle was experiencing large-scale or at least very visible regeneration um and Manchester was kind of just starting that process you know I think in the 2010s Manchester just you know pulled way ahead mm. and became a, you know a kind of second second London with all the positives and negatives that that entails I think um I mean that that would be my take from a distance um but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm still as as should be apparent from what we were saying about factory records. I'm still kind of in love with the pop cultural history of Manchester, even though, you know, again, as I say, it's I think there's a sense in which Manchester does need to get beyond that kind of mythology. Um, and perhaps the Northeast benefits from not having the burden of that musical heritage, arguably. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I you know, I don't know kind of offend anyone. So I'll stop. stop, 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 stop. <laughs> and, and what, in your view, what sort of went wrong, if you like, for Newcastle? Like, why did these two cities, in 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 your sense, pull pull apart in such a way? Well, I mean, as as you know, it, it was austerity. Um, you know, obviously, there's a much deeper and wider narrative of regional inequality, but you know, the 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 kind of uh, civic tragedy of austerity um, clearly hit areas of greater manchester very hard as well um and you know i'm not seeking to downplay that at all but i think i guess because newcastle was is a smaller city and its regeneration was on a smaller scale that austerity you know was just as savage in in newcastle as it was throughout the north um and you know that just kind of nixed any sense of the potential for revival in 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 the 21st century in in the northeast i mean you know still there's still people doing fantastic things and lots of people working on various initiatives that are doing you know doing a great job but um 
yeah, you know, the 2010s were sort of devastating for the Northeast and, it, you know, we definitely haven't recovered from what happened, you know, the effects of austerity and the the kind of sort of, uh, you know, the decimation of, of public spending that went on in the, in the 2010s. Yeah, that's something that, yeah, our work has definitely picked up in terms of the amount of money that's been taken out, even of local government alone, let alone kind of wider government spending on on welfare, housing and such like, and yeah. then how little is being replaced, so to speak, with the sort of levelling up funds and, and that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we've, as you say, I think it's really important in this in this conversation of the history of the the economic, social, cultural history of the North. We can't we can't not have a discussion without the effect of austerity because we're still we're still very much living it. But before we kind of move to on to the sort of today and 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 the future looking, I'm I'm keen to kind of go back to the politics um, mm -hmm. of the North, if we may. So you talk a lot about the birth of the Labour Party and kind of it starting as a grassroots community based movement and then sort of adding up to something greater and then basically becoming a sort of northern party, if you like. Can you talk to us about how the sort of emergence of the Labour Party, what its connections to the North meant in terms of the North's representation and, and, and that journey? Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Uh, just to kind of reduce quite a complex history to sort of um, to a kind of brief scale. Um, yeah, I mean, I think clearly you, you don't want to downplay the role of, uh, you know, particularly Sc Scottish industrial areas, uh, Welsh industrial areas and, 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 and London. But, you know, if you look at the, the, the first Labour kind of breakthroughs in Parliament in the uh, Edwardian period and sort of going into the 1910s and the 20s, the sort of proportion of seats that are in the north is, you know, usually somewhere around half, um, sometimes more. So, uh, you know, and this goes back to obviously that, you know, at various uh, pivotal points in the kind of uh, history of the trade union movement, uh, lots of which happened in the north. Again, lots of them happened elsewhere in in, in London. Uh, but I think, you know, there's a strong case for saying that, you know, a large portion, perhaps the majority, um, certainly in terms of the parliamentary arithmetic of, of, of Labour during its kind of breakthrough years was was focused on the North. Um, and as such, you know, even in 2019, apparently this kind of moment when Labour was in some accounts kind of wiped out in the North, or at least in certain areas, uh, even in the even in the 2019 election, Labour holds a majority of of northern seats, uh, and it's much much greater in 2017, the election that everyone tried to pretend didn't happen. Um, so I think you know there's a sense in which historically there hasn't been a need for a northern independence party mm. because the Labour Party essentially was viewed by not not all northerners by any means, and again you don't want to discount kind of rural uh, kind of Tory strongholds in the north, particularly in North and East Yorkshire, which if, you know those areas have kind of always been Tory, there are all kinds of uh, local nuances, historical nuances. Nonetheless, I think, you know, there's a strong case for saying that, you know, m large parts of the North view the Labour Party as their kind of historical birthright. Mm -hmm. And to an extent that's changed, although, again, it's it's complicated and it's, it's kind of shifting mm -hmm. all the time, uh, indeed, kind of month by month at the moment. And that, no, it's really interesting to say that because, as you say, the kind of the North is a often talked about as one place, and of course, <laughs> we well know that um, very many different identities and communities live within it. And I think there's also an intersection here with class and the types of lives people are living in the North. Because whilst, whilst of course, we have some of the worst weights of child poverty in the country, and some of those really hard and awful metrics which reflect much of what austerity and and high levels of poverty have done to our communities. At the same point. You, you do also have pockets of people doing all right. And I think actually there, there was an interesting article, I think it was in The Guardian, Duncan Weldon wrote about a year ago. And it was like, you know, it was almost a little bit Northern Safari. I didn't, you know, but anyway, you know, going up to the North and actually seeing that some people, you know, had a car in the drive and, and were living quite, you know, fulfilling lives and, and didn't have much to complain about. And actually a lot of the, the things that 
are found in the in the south whether that's expensive living congestion pollution high levels of poverty it's it's not universally the case so i'm kind of interested though in the link to your journey because you went down south you said you worked down in 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 the south for a long time and then came back to the north but obviously you came back at a particular moment didn't you because it was very much you were, the north was feeling the effects of austerity and you were quite shocked by what you saw can you tell us a bit about that how that transition and what you think had happened in the meantime since you had kind of been away yeah so i mean i i guess i left um the region to go to left the north to go down south mainly although i sort of had detours in different places went kind of back up to manchester for a bit and then back down south again um but i I left originally, I guess, in the kind of early to mid noughties, mm. which was the kind of height of of the kind of new labour millennial culture of, you know, regeneration and the urban renaissance and indeed the referendum for the Northeast Assembly, um, a failed referendum in, in 2004. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm i quite critical about the, the, the sort of shallowness of, of that moment. And, I you know, I don't think many people could argue that that was at least wholly successful nonetheless there was a kind of superficial sense in which things were getting better um culturally uh you know as we were saying it, there was a sense in which you know that newcastle was kind of almost on a par with manchester in, in terms of its revival its regeneration the kind of presence of new buildings and so on and so forth um obviously so i returned in 2015 to the north to the northeast got a job back in newcastle it's kind of long standing dream to sort of get back get back to the north um and yeah it was the you know it was the dregs of austerity it was still you know Cameron and Osborne were still in charge uh, I guess it was a year before the Brexit referendum uh and as you know as I say in the book I think you know 2010 to 2016 there's a case for saying that that is really the worst period the, the kind of period of most Kind of aggressive and heinous marginalization of the north you know since the 80s arguably since the the 30s you know that kind of cameron and osborne government you know dedicated to this kind of radical agenda of austerity but also in its kind of cultural demeanor very much focused on you know kind of eton the city of london you know oxbridge westminster that kind of that kind of sphere uh obviously we had northern powerhouse but i think you know Again, I you know I don't want to. I mean, I'm sure there are some people that did great things as as part of that and did good things with the kind of money available. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, of all the kind of slogans and buzzwords, you know, going back to the post war years, that is the most specious mm-hmm. and the most kind of he- heinous. As I say, you know, the the fact that you had this sense that you know we're going to turn these northern cities into sort of centres of Victorian energy. You have that alongside austerity, which is just withdrawing all of the funding from these, you know, cities and shutting down their kind of cultural uh, departments. You know, any any anything, you know, concrete and institutional dedicated to reviving the culture of the north, you're you're kind of getting rid of it. So it was very shocking. You know, you saw its effects. You saw, you know, there was, there was kind of homelessness in Newcastle where there hadn't been homelessness before. The buildings, you know, a, 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 you know, the council clearly doesn't have enough money to kind of maintain mm. the parts of the city that it owns properly, and you know, and so on and so forth. So it was, it was shocking and and quite devastating, actually. And you're quite in your book, you are quite scathing of the sort of leveling up agenda, and I think you refer to them as marketing strategies. I guess, whilst you know partly of course it's my job to hold the government's feet to the fire and make make sure they come good on their promises so um for me I guess I have a different tactic just because it's 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 part of it's part of what I do but I'm kind of interested in on the one hand we spoke earlier in the conversation about the sort of collective imagining and and having an optimism or a hope for the the future of the north and I suppose a challenge to some of what you say in the book which is in in parts quite um yeah skeptical I suppose of these is of these agendas is well isn't isn't that trying to do that you know isn't that trying to say we recognize you know the the extent of what's happening in the north and and regions like it 
And here's that chance to all come together behind what might be a slogan, but actually there's lots of good bits underneath it. I mean, you know, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate, but I am putting that to you as, as a sort of challenging of how we reconcile both having this hope, this collective imagination whilst also sort of being slightly skeptical of, of political agendas under similar headings. Yeah, I mean, that's a, 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 it's a very fair point. And as you say, <laughs> to an extent, it's a, it's a question of our different um, roles in a sense that you're, you're trying to do something constructive. I'm <laughs> kind of dealing with these quite kind of abstract, in a sense, imaginative, historical, kind of grand grand and grand narratives in a, in, a, in a sense, um, which lead me to be slightly skeptical you know and, and uh i guess it's you know it's rem- remiss of me in a sense that i'm I'm not more constructive but it, that isn't you know that's not my day job i guess um but yeah no i i think I, you know i i do yeah i mean i think the 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 the, the thing about leveling up is that you know I, I don't think even someone who is trying to make it work could ultimately say that it's going to have a really meaningful positive impact under the present government mm-hmm. uh you know i think that kind of tory leveling up for all that it might result result in kind of small scale victories and in, in in small small scale kind of positive things i just think you know you look at the even the just the kind of internal dynamics of the of the tory party uh even you know even go who is you know quoted in the epigraph of that awful thing he said about the north in the in, in the 80s uh, you know, he's clearly, you know, not being allowed to kind of even achieve kind of small scale victories. Um, so, yeah, I'm sceptical that levelling up in the kind of official sense of a kind of current conservative party led, conservative government led initiative is going to do anything other than re- repeat the very modest successes that we we got in the, you know, in the millennium period for example and and probably do much less well I would say. And when we think about the I guess one area where I would kind of argue there has been progress is on devolution and obviously we now have I think the latest stats says it's actually 74 percent of the north once the latest deals on the table have been agreed will be living within a devolution deal so obviously part of part of reducing regional inequality part of this whole whole debate has to be about power and political representation is of course a a big part of that do you do you think devolution is window dressing or do you think devolution is a is a fundamental change or somewhere in between what do you think (laughs) i've (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm here to interview you, okay, Alex. Okay. That. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I should. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I guess that one way of responding to that argument that you know, um, you know, it, you, sh- you know, surely at least this is something, and um, you know, you have to be constructive about these things and not just kind of dismiss everything. I guess I would respond to that by saying, well, sure. But I just don't think anything other than something really radical is going to work, in which case, you know, these other kind of initiatives, in a sense, um, you know, they're a little bit, it is just kind of, you know, kicking the can on the road or or whatever metaphor you want to use it. You know, know, they make a lot of noise. You know, I I was was sort of pleasantly surprised with with the Labour reports. I forget the title. It had some kind of very unwieldy title, didn't it? But the the kind of Labour the Gordon Brown Brown's Commission, yeah, yeah, Gordon Brown's thing. You know, I think generally that had the right idea. You know, and you can't underestimate the radicalism of getting rid of the House of Lords. Mm. You know, there are various questions about what would replace it, but you know, even just that basic mm. realization that you have to do something like that mm. in order for things to to you know to even begin to change. I was kind of pleasantly surprised by of course again you've got the kind of internal politics of the Labour Party you know kind of leadership wanting to allegedly kind of water down the you know these proposals and to be frank a, a pessimism that Starmer has the kind of personal you know inclination really to do to you know to follow through on these quite radical proposals and 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 not just kind of 
follow, you know, uh, implement the proposals in, in the report, but then kind of continue what's necessary in order to devolve power meaningfully. Um, so that, I mean, that is my kind of general take. I, you know, again, I, there are limits to my, big limits to my expertise. And, you, you know, that's why I, <laughs> that's I to throw the question back onto you because you're much more my, uh, I mean, informed and an expert about these things than, than I am. But that would be my kind of macro view. Yeah. And I, I, I actually tend, tend to agree with that. I mean, obviously we're at IPPR North and personally and professionally, you know, very much pro devolution, but it's got to be done in a way that, as you say, it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things of the, the Gordon Brown report that you um, reference is the idea of putting into, well, you know, it sounds like you would like a constitution of <laughs> written constitution of some kind, mm -hmm. but putting into law, the powers that have been in, invested in um, Metro mayors in particular, which actually, of course at the moment is still very much at the behest of government and, you know, in principle could be withdrawn if if the political tides turned or, or decisions were made otherwise, you know what I mean? And I think it's that sort of feeling that we want to lock in some sort of progress as opposed to feeling like whenever you make a bit of progress whether it's on devolution or in other fronts that suddenly it can be undone um like some of the things that had done really you know made helped a lot of um people across the country back in 2010 that were undone pretty straight away and regional development agencies of course being one of those pieces of architecture so i, th I think we're we're very much very much on the same page but i think we've kind of got to the point of the conversation where we're already hinting at well, what comes next and what is this radicalism that is needed to really, um, I think you call it the great reversal in your book, to, to really change the direction. So obviously in recent history, we've had a whole host of attempts in different ways, different architectures, whether that's regional development agencies, um, local enterprise partnerships, Northern Powerhouse, leveling up. I mean, you know, but yet when the public's polled on, on these areas, you know, it very much is the case that people still want and expect levelling up to happen. Mm -hmm. So I guess I see it very much as my job and people in my position um, to kind of help help advance and, and to make sure it does, does happen in practice. What from your kind of experience, both professional and well, you're, you've, you've got your political take, but and personal, what do you think that points to in terms of the kind of guiding themes or ideas that will help take the North forward in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the million million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I'm, I'm ready for the answer. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> I will. I will reveal reveal to you. No, I, I, you know, there's a sense in which, if, of course in writing a, a book like this or, or doing anything all, all you can really you know you can't you can't, can't look into the future it's it's very it's you know you can look at the past you can look at the present and you can try to say what that suggests about the future but ob obviously you you know it's you quickly get into the realms of kind of wi-fi um you know kind of pro prophecy almost or kind of absurd conjectures when you look into the future, nonetheless, I think, you know, both the political and the cultural sides of, of the narrative of the North and the narrative of regional inequality going back decades and decades, if, if not centuries, points to the need for, um, as you say, and as I say in the book, you know, a great reversal or a, a great kind of overhaul of the kind of hard structures of this country. Um, and that, you know, as we said, that does bring you to a point where, you know, you can get quite, it's almost a kind of cul-de-sac because, you know, is, is that realistically on the table right now? Pro probably not. Although, you know, I think it could quite easily, you know, this, it's going to be a long 21st century. Lots of stuff is going to happen with the monarchy, with the United Kingdom, you know, our relationship with Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and so on and so forth. So things can very quickly change, um, you know, with all, I guess, revolutionary moments, we'd be talking about a kind of small scale revolutionary moments. They happen very quickly, you know, nothing happens for um, 
for years and then years happen in days or whatever the kind of Lenin quotation is, I forget. Um, so, so yeah, I think ev everything points to the fact that you do need a kind of radical overhaul of the country. You know, as I say in the book, the, you know, the Industrial Revolution, obviously, this kind of shaping foundational, fundamental core of the North's history and identity that is the lesson which which we get from that, which, you know, that it was a revolu li literal revolution. And that was um, that to an extent was an overhaul of the at least the kind of civic and economic dynamic of, of the country. But, you know, even that didn't really balance out um, the kind of north south divide, as it were, or or, or truly em empower the north. And, and it obviously with the industrialization that um, it kind of uh, petered away into, um, you know, the narrative, the, the, the moment we're in now. Um, you know, I, I obviously I think, you know, something like starting with the, the Gordon Brown thing and, you know, the kind of recommendation to abolish the House of Lords. You know, I think some form of federalism would be a, a great leap forward. You know, I'm not a kind of governance expert. I You know, I don't have a kind of very... Uh, minutely worked out plan for exactly how that would work but it seems to me that you know it you know some kind of rational reorganization of the country so that it merely resembles uh you know other kind of post-enlightenment countries which which you know are divided up in kind of at least semi-rational ways rather than this kind of medieval system based on you know the monarchy and kind of land ownership by the aristocracy and you know a part of that is this kind of radical centralization of the country on the on the kind of medieval capital which is mm. London. um so you know i think the solution has to be radical something like federalism would seem to me to be just the, the rational way to go um beyond that uh, you know I, I i would sort of defer to the kind of go you know governance experts but Certainly, the, the, the kind of cultural and imaginative narratives and examples in the book, I think, do, do kind of point to that sense of, you know, continually, people in the North continually dreaming big, trying to kind of um, regenerate and revive and renew not just Northern culture, but, you know, by extension, English or British culture as a whole, but just continually coming up against a, a kind of glass ceiling, as it were, which is this kind of political, this kind of hard political structure in this country that we have which is incredibly limiting and conservative and you know kind of you know pre-industrial almost mm. no and i i very much agree with that that kind of notion that it's regional equality is hardwired into our country's systems really isn't it and until we address the systems that continue to facilitate it we'll be forever stuck in this sort of bind where we have to go go to the south to ask for our dues you know and it's 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 immature actually you know it's a very immature it feels like a very immature system of governments and I I do I suppose amongst all the sort of you know rightfully placed skepticism about the leveling up agenda I, I do think along the way we are making bits of progress that seem small but actually you know once the country is covered by devolved power and metro mayors once we have a more mature conversation about fiscal devolution i think we do move further towards albeit it's not an automatic process towards the kind of more federal kind of system that you that you outline and and you allude to i think that's that's really interesting um that's I, I, th I think actually you've you've ended you know that that section on a very positive note for what what actually can be done and achieved, Alex. So I think you've you know you've you've turned that cynicism around. We got there in the end. <laughs> and then finally, just to come back to your your own personal story, like obviously we 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 talked earlier about you know your your journey to the to the south and back to the north. Firstly, I just had a kind of question of principle because this is something that just comes up time and time again on the leveling up agenda which is obviously the sort of political narrative has changed totally from, you know, the Heseltine days of get on your bike and to go find a, find a job to the kind of political agenda today. And it actually is quite echoed in your book, not politically, but just in terms of the, the concept of you should be able to kind of live the life you want to lead in the place that 
you were born or you grew up. So is that is that something that that motivates and sort of drives your your sense of you know what's fair I suppose yeah I think that's absolutely central I mean I think um you know you get into various debates with people in in London in particular and you know particularly I guess on on the left it's you know very quickly deteriorates into sort of horrible sort of social media spats but I think the one you know way in which I would appeal to to people who have perhaps you know lived in London and, and grown up in the southeast um to to sort of think about regional inequality and how it works is this experience of migration um which you know it, it's not at all as kind of vicious and as um um extreme as it as experiences of migration in you know in other parts of the world and and, and between countries but it is quite profound and quite ser- you know a kind of serious shaping influence on people's lives the, the centralization of the country and you know the dislocation that comes with um and you know i see this amongst all of my friends who you know grew up in the northeast they've all or almost all had to kind of live in different parts of the country in a way that just is, isn't the case for my kind of friends from university, for example, who are from London and the Southeast, who often, you know, grew up in London, often went to university relatively nearby uh, and and came back to London. And that's a kind of radically different experience in that you 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 are kind of still part, you've re- kind of remained part of your community in, in lots of cases, not all cases, uh, or there's, there's a greater chance that you have, you're kind of closer to family and so on and so forth. You know, there are ne- really kind of profound negative consequences for people, not just from the north, from, you know, but from Wales, Scotland, southwest as well. Shouldn't just have this kind of simplistic north-south binary, but and you know, uh, mo- you know, moving to moving to London, if you don't want to do that, if, if you're kind of an economic migrant, as it were, I think that's a problem. Anyone with any kind of rational take on this would would say that it is. Um, so I think that is that is a kind of central fact of 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 life and our economy and our culture and society still and it kind of has been obviously going back decades and centuries. Um, but yeah, you know, it's been quite poignant. I've, you know, in in sort of getting the book out, I've had sort of interviews. I already had you know various interviews with people, and often it's a kind of northern uh, person in London, kind of you know with you know experiencing this kind of form of exile in a sense um and economic migrancy um so yeah i think i think that is very fundamental and and that is something i would definitely argue for is is that sense of having the right to if you want to stay where you are of course if you don't want to that should also be empowered and enabled if you want to kind of be mobile and go go between different places but if you want to stay in the same city as you know your brothers and sisters and parents and friends you should probably a good a kind of good enlightened modern society would probably allow that to happen in kind of most cases if not all um you know i had a very complicated narrative to do with you know uh sort of family bereavements and so on and so forth but yeah it was my dream to go back up to the north i was in- incredibly lucky to get one of the few jobs in the northeast you know it's big problems still with employment obviously in the northeast um and i'm very aware of the you know being very lucky um and and privileged in a sense that that i was able to move back to the north but i think everybody should be empowered to do that to either remain where they grew up or if they want to kind of experiment and go different places to to return to where they grew up if they want to do that brilliant well on that empowering and uplifting note we shall close the conversation there thank you so much Alex for the discussion today and again Alex's book The North Will Rise again in all good bookshops now um, and indeed actually RSA have a code foils RSA 20 and gives you 20% off um, his new book so thank you again everyone for watching if you'd like to learn more watch back go to the rsa.org and you'll find this and many other talks um, ready for you. So thank you all again. Thank you, Alex, and goodbye for now.